The Secretary General of Japan's governing Liberal Democratic Party says the country's idle nuclear reactors should be restarted once their safety is verified. Shigeru Ishiba delivered a speech in Sapporo on Saturday to explain the government's energy policy. Ishiba said Japan should reduce its dependence on nuclear power by developing renewable energy sources such as wind and solar. But he said the current energy supply is on a tight rope. Our party wants to put the country's nuclear reactors back online once their safety is confirmed. All nuclear reactors in Japan are currently offline for safety inspections. Ishiba noted that new reactors are being built in numerous countries including China and many with Japanese technology. The LDP Secretary General stressed that Japan should further advance its nuclear technology and promote its export. A team from the International Atomic Energy Agency will soon visit the damaged nuclear power plant in northeastern Japan. The experts will investigate the leaking of contaminated water from storage tanks and moves to decommission the plant. IAEA Director General Yukia Amano told reporters in Washington that the team will be dispatched at the end of November. We are planning to send our um, uh, peer review missions uh, in autumn, that is uh, the IAEA mission on decommissioning, and um, uh, it covers uh, the uh, contaminated water issues. Amano says Japan needs to cooperate with international organizations in addressing the nuclear crisis in order to regain the trust of the global community. He said the team will include seawater analysts. Amano says he believes that the visit may ease concerns of Japan's neighbors in other countries about the dangers of the radioactive water leaks. The U.S. Energy Secretary says his government and American companies are ready to help Japan with the removal of radioactive tritium from cooling water. Ernest Moniz spoke to NHK one day after visiting the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility. This was my first trip to Fukushima and it left certainly quite an impression. Uh, one of the impressions was that two and a half years after uh, the tragedy that one still sees the uh, very very clearly uh, the power of the tsunami and all the, all the damage uh, that it did. Modi said he realizes it's a big challenge to process contaminated water stored at the plant. Tokyo Electric Power Company has been able to remove most of the radioactive materials. The one exception is hard to filter tritium which emits beta rays with comparatively weaker energy. Tritium, uh, for example, is a, is a more difficult uh, challenge, and that's a place where uh, we at the Department of Energy, but also our, our industry, uh, has uh, experience. 
Japan's industry ministry is considering disposal solutions submitted by domestic and international companies. Modi said his department and U.S. firms are ready to help the Japanese government get concrete results. Staying in Japan, radioactive cesium has been detected in some of Korea's stock feeds imported from Japan. Up to 1.4 back rolls of cesium were detected in some 700 tons of feed for cultured fish, while levels as high as 2.3 back rolls were found in more than 85 tons of assorted fish feed for, other, for livestock. About 10,000 tons of different types of feeds are estimated to have been distributed so far nationwide. The Korean government has banned seafood imports from Fukushima and nearby prefectures, but has loose regulations on stock feed imports from those areas. Experts warn that although the detected amounts fall under the government's safety levels, the situation could change if fish and livestock continue to consume the cesium-tainted feed. The mysterious die-off of West Coast sea stars is spreading. The so-called melting sea stars were first noticed in Vancouver, then in Seattle, and now in California. King 5 environmental specialist Gary Chittam has more on the rapidly spreading disease and why scientists are so concerned and are warning the video of the sea stars might be disturbing. Scaredy cat. At the right Seattle here. Aquarium. Yeah, it's a tube worm. They teach by feel. Is this what you were touching? You're trying to touch? But this week, one species is missing. Took them out as a precaution. Uh, there is a huge unknown as to why there is currently a, a die off happening out in the wild. Few people would want to touch one of these. Sunflower sea stars infected with a strange melting disease literally coming apart in the hands of biologists. The Seattle Aquarium sunflower sea stars are being held in isolated tanks away from the public. They're in quarantine. So we want to make sure that we can closely monitor them for any signs of disease. Also, we just don't want any diseased animals out where people can touch them. At least three of the aquarium's captive sea stars were melting. Their tanks are filled with Puget Sound water. And the scene out there is worse. Aquarium divers found a much more serious situation in the wild population along the Seattle waterfront. The victims they brought up were in various stages of the disease. The estimates of infected sea stars has grown from 30 percent to 50 or 60 percent in just a few days. And now biologists in California are finding it too. Something is causing sea stars to be diseased um, along the coast at different locations. Whenever this happens, the theory starts swirling around. So they try to find some common threads, and they did find one, us. They are areas that are more heavily populated. Biologists need to find out if big cities like Vancouver, Seattle, and those in the Bay Area are causing it, or if they're just the first places to notice it. Is it a natural disease? Is it triggered by environmental factors, city runoff, acidification, or climate change? West Coast Aquariums have sent samples to several labs and are still awaiting results. An important species to the overall ocean health and one of their star attractions is at risk. In Seattle, Gary Chittam, King 5 News. Seattle Aquarium scientists say if they can identify the problem, they may be able to treat sea stars in their exhibits. But there's not much they can do for the sea stars in the wild. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has specific requirements for the design, construction, and operation of nuclear power plants to ensure that those plants can withstand earthquakes that might be expected in their area. Those regulations are based on the safe shutdown ground motion, which means the level of vibration safety-related structures and equipment at a plant must endure during a seismic event and still function. That ground motion number varies from nuclear plant to nuclear plant based on the geology of the area, its seismic history, and specific geotechnical information, or the way engineers use geology to determine building requirements. 
Two events in 2011, only a few months apart, highlighted the importance of the NRC's seismic regulations. In March 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Japan caused a tsunami that disabled power supplies and cooling to several nuclear reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear station. Important safety structures and equipment were largely undamaged by the earthquake's ground motion, but flooding from the tsunami created major problems. In August 2011, a much smaller earthquake, measuring 5.8 in magnitude, occurred near Mineral, Virginia, close to the North Anna nuclear station. The plant exceeded some ground motion levels for which it was licensed, and both North Anna units safely shut down. Detailed reviews and inspections by Dominion, the plant operator, and the NRC confirmed there was no damage to safety equipment and both North Anna units were given permission to restart in November 2011. These two events provided valuable insight into how nuclear plants might withstand an actual earthquake and provided important information the NRC is using to improve its regulations and ensure the safety of U.S. nuclear plants. That gave us um, some understanding and confidence that the um, seismic margin which is the level of capacity that a plant has beyond the level of shaking that it experienced is, is actually truly what we had been calculating. NRC seismologists have worked closely with NRC inspectors, license reviewers, and others within the agency to apply the real world lessons of Fukushima and North Anna to all other U.S. nuclear plants. That effort included NRC teams walking through the nuclear plants to look at important structures, systems, and components, and determine if there were any potential issues with how that plant might fare during an earthquake. In addition to information from the two actual earthquakes, the NRC continually works to make sure potential earthquake hazard information for all nuclear plants is as up-to-date and as accurate as possible. A major effort in that area began several years before the earthquakes in Japan and Virginia. That analysis confirmed that the country's nuclear plants remain safe, and although the overall seismic risk is low, some plant estimates may have increased and are getting further NRC attention. Over the next few years, we'll take a look at that hazard and do risk assessments also for the plant to determine if upgrades are needed, uh, or determine if further uh, you know, equipment needs to be upgraded or um, additional work needs to be done. So um, it's an ongoing effort, very extensive, very thorough, and um, we're confident that we will determine that the plants are, are continue to be safely operated. Because I do work here and I see the way that the performance criteria and the performance levels and the care that's given into our the assessment that we're doing for these plants. And I think that my own level of confidence uh, or comfort is definitely um, getting stronger as we're going through this recommendation 2.1 process where we're, we're doing a very thorough job of putting numbers and risk numbers and new hazard numbers against these plants. Fortunately, the seismic risk for most U.S. nuclear plants is very low and all plants are designed to withstand the ground motions expected in that area. However, the NRC continues to examine information from actual earthquakes and review improved predictive models, as well as inspect current plants, those under construction, and those still in the design phase, to be certain that people living near U.S. nuclear plants are protected.
Mornings at 10.30 starts now. Next week, a Hanford whistleblower will be in court, fighting to have his case heard by a jury. A former top Hanford engineer is suing for alleged retaliation. As King 5 investigator Susanna Frame reports in her ongoing series, Hanford's Dirty Secrets, the 44-year employee says he was punished for raising safety concerns at the nuclear reservation. This is Hanford's 21st century embarrassment, the unfinished waste treatment plant, or WTP. It's the facility that's supposed to take nuclear waste out of leaking underground tanks and turn it into glass logs for permanent disposal. But at $13 billion plus so far, it's tripled in construction costs. It's a decade behind schedule, and the science to make it work, they're still working on that. I was now the enemy. And this is the guy who first warned the place is in trouble. They did not want to hear any more. Dr. Walt Temesitis is a mechanical, chemical, and systems engineer. Three years ago, he warned his bosses a key component needed more work. What was the message you were telling them? I was telling them that there was a situation that was really problematic, could be a major problem, and it had to be tested. His research showed mixers inside the plant weren't powerful enough to prevent a dangerous possibility, the buildup of flammable hydrogen gas. The worst case scenario would be a criticality and trapping of hydrogen gas, which could lead to a hydrogen explosion. His bosses didn't agree. The government contractors, Bechtel and URS, were on a schedule. By June 30th, 2010, they needed the mixing problem solved. Federal records show money was on the line. The Department of Energy had this mandate. Fix the mixing by June 30th, 2010, or the companies could say goodbye to millions in bonus money. And there was more. In an internal email, an executive writes the Tamasitis problem could cost them another $50 million. Extra money Bechtel wanted from Congress that year. We're dealing with radioactive waste. Behind the scenes, Bechtel's head honcho, Frank Russo, was most outspoken. He wrote to his managers that Walt is killing us and to do something about it. Protect the environment. But his message to the public, all is well. This project will achieve its mission. Despite evidence from Tamasitis, Bechtel and the Department of Energy announced they'd sewn up all the mixing problems right on time, June 30th, 2010. Frank Russo wrote they had outstanding results. So the U.S. government rewarded the company with a $4.2 million bonus, and Congress forked over the extra $50 million. The problem was officially over. And was that a lie? Yes. Yes. So it sounds like in this scenario that money was trumping safety. Oh, there no doubt. Money and schedule trumped the safety part to drive forward. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Temesitis didn't go away. He kept at it. He submitted a long list of unsolved problems to company heads, including the mixing issue. The very next day, Temesitis got this news. You're fired from the WTP. Give me your badge, your cell phone, your BlackBerry, and you're out of here. Dr. Temesitis was off the project, but not the payroll. The company moved him to this building, in the basement. He sat alone in a cramped space, complete with storage boxes, rat poison feeders, and copy machines. But he didn't have a phone, a boss, or anything to do. Did they give you any work no, to do? No, I had no work to do. What was the message when they got you out of there? The message was, don't do what Walter did. Don't raise issues. Shut up. Shut up. Do what we say. In the months alone in the basement, Temesitis read a lot, including one study after another showing he was right. The Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board agreed with his mixing findings. So did the Government Accountability Office. Then the most drastic move of all. Obama's Secretary of Energy at the time said, that's enough. He ordered construction to come to a stop. No more building until Bechtel could figure out the technical problems, including the mixing. You look at all that and then judge whether I was right or wrong. Temesitis eventually got out of the basement and in the last few months even got some work. And in September, more good news. Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz issued a directive to stop the harassment of whistleblowers. He wrote, we must not deter, discourage, or penalize employees for speaking up. Six days later, Dr. Temesitis got an unexpected visit from a company executive with an unexpected message. You're fired. So before I could go, hi, he says to me, well, today's your last day. Pack your things up, and we're going to escort you to the door. So that happened just last month. It was a bombshell to him. So why was 
Dunk's homicide is fired right out of the blue. He thinks they got rid of him because the company wants to get rid of that legal battle. Contractors offered him a severance package with a string attached. Drop all the lawsuits or there's no money. He's refusing to sign that agreement and he's pressing on with a big hearing coming up next week. So it's not over. Mm -hmm. That fight is not over for him.